Coming up, China launches Tiangong 2. Pluto paints its moon, and we talk Blue Origin, and I embarrassingly mention how I just figured out their naming convention for rockets. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Hello and welcome to tomorrow, episode 9.29 for September 17th, 2016. Now before we get started with the show proper, we of course want to thank these amazing people. These are our tomorrow Patreon premiere members. Now these folks have given us $10 or more per episode towards our live shows that we crowdfund through Patreon. So these folks, they get access to everything. They get early access to the live show, early access to After Dark, uh, access to our Slack channel, which is a really fun place to be. So if you'd like to consider crowdfunding the shows of tomorrow, please head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And of course, I am your host for the news, Jared Head. I've also got Space Mike off to my left, your right, I think. And then next to Space Mike, yeah. I've got the beautiful, the talented, the lovely, the not my wife, Carrie Ann. So um, we, of course, always start off the show with a launch, it seems. Mm -hmm. So Mike, let's go ahead and start off the show with a launch. Yeah, and this launch in particular was a bit of a surprise launch. It wasn't announced publicly ahead of time. This was actually done by Israel's Ministry of Defense. And uh, this launch took place on Tuesday from the, I believe it's pronounced Palmakim Air Force Base, which is near Tel Aviv. So let's check out the footage for that. And the audio is a little bit delayed on this, so you won't hear the, uh, the, the sound from the rocket for just a moment. Any second now. There's a couple different views, which I appreciate. This nice. launch took place on 1430 Coordinated Universal Time on uh, Tuesday, September 13th. And the rocket was actually a Shavit 2, which means comet in Hebrew. And it's a three-stage solid rocket booster, and it launched in a little bit of an unusual way. When Israel launches satellites, they have to do so by launching west instead of east. And they have to launch against the rotation of the Earth and put their satellites into retrograde orbits. The reason that they do this is to avoid flying over populated areas, especially with less than friendly neighbors. So they fly over the Mediterranean Sea instead, letting their spent rocket stages drop there. Now the payload for this launch was the OFEC-11 spy satellite, and OFEC means horizon. And uh, not much is known about the satellite, but the Ministry of Defense did report that they were having trouble with the satellite after it reached orbit, without really going into much ET e detail as to what those particular uh, problems were with the satellites, but whatever problems they were, uh, I'm not even sure whether or not I should root for it or not, since this is a spy satellite. But in any case, the launch itself and the rocket that launched the satellite into space was successful. So congratulations to Israel for that. Well, this is only the the eighth launch of this rocket ever, so we don't get to see a whole lot of these. So congratulations to Israel for at least the successful launch. Yeah, pretty interesting that they have to go retrograde with their uh, their launches immediately. So. Uh, that's that's yeah. pretty, pretty neat. Speaking of something else that's neat, I bet you guys didn't know this, but Pluto, dwarf planet Pluto, <laughs> is a bit of an artist in and around its area. Um, and that's because if you look at its moon, Charon, which we can actually see an image of Charon here, you'll notice that that polar region on it is dark. And scientists now have a good idea as to why that polar region appears darker than the rest of Sharon does. And of course, NASA's New Horizons probe flew by dwarf planet Pluto in July of 2015 and collected data from both Pluto and its moon, Sharon. And scientists have hypothesized that Sharon would capture methane stripped from Pluto's atmosphere, where it would then freeze to the surface and actually turn a little bit reddish due to exposure to UV light. So this image that we have right here is a actual, like, color image that you and I eyes could see, but if we could enhance this image um, a little bit, it would actually appear a little bit redder up in there. Yes, just like this enhanced image um, that Zoom we have. Zoom in, enhance. Zo enhance, enhance, enhance. 
Illuminati confirmed. So yes, uh, <laughs> as you can see on the moon right there. Now, computer models were used to verify this hypothesis and that during the 248 year orbit of Pluto and Charon, uh, Charon's poles are exposed to 100 years of continuous light and 100 years of continuous darkness. This allows temperatures to dip down to minus 257 degrees Celsius. Woo, that's cold. And then it becomes warm enough to sublime the methane ice off of the surface so it leaves behind the heavy hydrocarbons, which are then bombarded with ultraviolet radiation, which then turns them a bit more red in color. So that is why the area on Sharon's poles are darker than any other part of Sharon. So just a very uh, cool very result. Yeah, something that we're still getting um, from the science that New Horizons is still sending back. So very, very cool stuff. And speaking of science, there is something <laughs> that was put into orbit for science, uh, we think, uh, Mike. So uh, tell us That's a little right. bit about that. Hopefully they will be doing a lot more science with this version. This is what we're talking about, is China has started their next phase of their human spaceflight program. And they did that by successfully launching their Tiangong-2 space station module into space. And this was on Thursday. And oh my goodness, there is a ton of footage for this launch. China what? Even, some of the Chinese media even live webcast this launch You're on YouTube, us. which, as a reminder, is banned in China. I mean, they, they live webcast on Weibo, too, which is, you know, the Chinese essentially version of, of YouTube, but that was for us. That was so the entire world could see this wow. launch and, and all the different things. So in, without going into even more detail, let's check out some of this beautiful footage of this launch. Very good. This launch took place on 1404 Coordinated Universal Time on Thursday, September 15th, and it launched aboard the Long March 2F rocket, which is usually used for their manned Shenzhou uh, capsules. And the launch and deployment of the Tiangong 2, as I said, were successful. Ground stations are communicating with the module, and its solar panels have unfurled and are collecting power, and everything looks clear to proceed with their planned operations at the station. Now, the next thing that they have in mind is to actually raise raise the orbit of the station slightly to prepare for a launch next month, which will carry a crew of Taikonauts aboard Shenzhou 11. And they're going to be staying at the space station module for about a month. The interior of the station has been upgraded with, uh, uh, from the Tiangong 1 version to allow longer stays and hopefully for better science experiments. And they've, they've even kind of adopted the, uh, the, um, the American method, I suppose, of having the, the modular racks uh, inside of the, of the space station module that can be swapped out with whatever they want. So that way, hopefully, they can do lots of different experiments there. The other thing that is special about this uh, particular space station that is an upgrade from Tiangong-1 is that uh, after they have the, the crew docked there and uh, the crew leaves, next year, hopefully uh, around April, they up their first cargo spacecraft, which is called Tianzhou, sending up the Tianzhou to the Tiangong. And this first version will be able to not only refuel the spacecraft, but uh, this particular one won't have a whole lot of cargo on board. And since there won't be any Taikonauts on board the station to unload it when the cargo spacecraft arrives, they won't be able to swap out anything. But just by proving that they can uh, send up one of these cargo modules and refuel the station is one of the stepping stones that they need in order to move forward towards their near class space station that they want to build in the very near future. So the, that's all very exciting news, and I'm very uh, grateful that China is being very public about it. And I mean, this is, you know, it's a source of national pride for China, just like all of the human spaceflight programs across the world are a source of pride for their uh, indigenous nations. So I'm very hopeful that we're going to be seeing a lot more footage like this when uh, the, the, the crew of Shenzhou 11 launches next month, and hopefully for their stay while they're there. So uh, very cool indeed, and looking forward to more from China. Yeah, um, from our chat room, uh, Mini Elon says um, that they're going to show the Shenzhou 11 launch and docking on YouTube like they did for Shenzhou 9 and 10. So it should be pretty cool to actually watch that live. So, And I know that I will uh, definitely 
make the time uh, to see that actually yeah. happen. So I've got a little quick story that kind of talks about uh, us, if you will, you know, because we're, you know, we've got carbon in us. Yes. And that carbon comes from the earth. And there's been a lot of debate as to where that carbon came from. Ah. Uh, lots, of, lots of people saying meteorites and asteroid impacts and cometary impacts and other fun things. Um, but there's been a new study that's been put out by Rice University that says mm -hmm. the, the carbon on Earth may have actually potentially come from a gigantic impact, something similar to this artist's impression um, that we have right here. Now, the idea is that the early Earth's surface would have been hot enough to either boil off all of the carbon that was there or that the material of the Earth was at a low enough density that the carbon would have sank to Earth's core. They found um, that when they simulated it in a computer, um, that you could actually get a carbon-rich planet about the size of Mercury impacting the Earth about 100 million years after the formation of the Earth. So a mere 4.4 billion years ago, not all that long ago. Um, and it could actually deliver the amount of carbon that is necessary for our biosphere that we see today. Since most of the carbon that we see on the Earth is either in the atmosphere, in the crust, or in the mantle. So uh, some very interesting research coming out of Rice University there. So uh, we, we are made of star stuff, obviously, because that's where uh, all of these elements come from. Mm -hmm. um, but we, our carbon may have actually ended up also coming from uh, a, a thing the size of Mercury hitting the Earth. So, um, so, so just an interesting study uh, that kind of popped out this week and kind of came under the radar, but was still uh, very, very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So, Mike, tell us about one of the more interesting launchers uh, that I, I really like to watch. It's called Vega. Tell us. That's right. This last week was a busy week. Three launches. So uh, the Vega rocket, Ariane Space launched their Vega rocket uh, from Kuro French Guiana in South America. And this was a pretty cool launch and a really interesting way that they delivered the payloads. But in any case, let's check out the launch footage. And unfortunately, they uh, made a slight mistake here. You'll see. This is what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, we get the... Unfortunately, we get the audio from the Launch Control Center itself and not from uh, outside. So we don't get to hear the roar of this rocket coming off. And this is a solid rocket that has a liquid-fueled upper stage. It's actually a four-stage rocket, uh, the first three st stages being solid rocket fuel. Now, this launch took place at 10.43 local time on Thursday in Kuro, French Guiana, uh, like I said, where the launch took place from. But uh, uh, that was 10.43 local time. In coordinated universal time, it was actually actually 1.43 on Friday. So the launch took place either Thursday or Friday, depending on where you were or if you follow coordinated universal time. And in any case, uh, the way that we wanted to talk about the interesting way that they uh, delivered the payloads, there's actually a launch animation that they had near the end of this uh, uh, launch footage that they had here, if we can cut to that. And for the first up, this, this, this lock rocket launch was delivering five satellites. The first four satellites were for Google's Terabella imaging company and uh, hopefully to update a lot of the Google Maps information. And uh, this was carrying SkySat 4, 5, 6, and 7. You can see the four of them there uh, uh, arranged in, uh, there in a section after the payload uh, fairing deployed. But the interesting way about how they delivered this is after uh, it raises orbit and releases those four satellites, which, by the way, were released at an orbit of 500 kilometers or 310 miles up, and then it has a different payload fairing adapter, which they call VESPA, which is released. You can see here. And the main payload on this is, is revealed, which is actually an imaging satellite satellite for Peru, which is a, a, a spy satellite, actually. And so I really find that interesting. It's like a payload fairing inside of a payload fairing, even though it's an adapter to launch uh, smaller payloads on top. So I really like those kind of a type of innovative ways to be launching multiple small satellites at once. And uh, so this was a completely successful launch. And all the information so far looks like that all five satellites are operational, or at least uh, they're getting healthy signals from them. And everything is going well. Fantastic. That's always, you know, it's always great just to see uh, uh, so much success happening of late. Um, it's, it's, it's exciting that we get to do all this stuff uh, like every week. Like yeah. every week something <laughs> new is happening and something exciting is happening. So uh, this is just fantastic. And I, I love that all this stuff uh, gets going on. The so. very short story of the way that we started this podcast is that 
Ben said he wanted to talk about space, and I said that there wasn't enough to talk about. Uh, so he made me promise that as soon as we didn't have enough things to talk about, that we would stop the podcast. Yeah. And we, we're, we're still going. Right. So, so, yeah, here we are. In the <laughs> more, season. more, more. Exactly. So, yeah. All right. So I want to talk about one of, the, one of my favorite missions, one of my favorite scientific missions ever, which is the European Space Agency's Gaia probe. Mm. And uh, Gaia is such a cool mission, and I love the animation, too, of it launching um, with it here. So what is Gaia? Well, Gaia is a space telescope but it is not a space telescope in the sense that it looks at things up close. It's a space telescope in the sense that it actually looks at a very wide field of view and it very precisely tries to measure things. So it's, it's literally what I guess, I, for lack of a better term, I would call it a stellar mapping probe because it is designed with several cameras to actually accurately position where stars are and determine their brightness. And those cameras, they take in data at about 1.5 gigapixels each. So this allows for accurate 3D maps to be generated. And just this week, the European Space Agency has released its first round of data from Gaia. So Gaia did have some problems, though, uh, because shortly after launch, uh, it's it's a sol its sun shield uh, deployed insufficiently, and several of its mirrors froze, and then they had larger expansion of the materials that make up Gaia than they were expecting, so that affected the optics on board. But the scientists at the European Space Agency have done a fantastic job in finding solutions to these problems, and they've allowed Gaia to operate at its expected p uh, precision. So basically, Gaia has mapped accurately the position of about a billion stars in our own galaxy. So that's roughly 1% of the stars in our own galaxy. Hmm. And this is, the, this is the image based off of that first data release that they did. Um, now, they, Gaia also examined uh, 3,000 variable stars while doing this as well. And all of this together, this data helps us accurately model things like galactic formation. So how do galaxies form? Um, how do those galaxies evolve over time? Um, distances of things like star clusters, which helps tell us just how old those star clusters may be. And with things like those variable stars, um, that helps us nail down those sort of cosmic highway markers, those ways mm -hmm. that we can actually accurately tell distance. Um, and that's why this mission is so exciting because it's giving us so much data just about the universe itself. And that's really, really important stuff. Um, and we have not had a mission that looks at a billion stars um, all at once like Gaia does. There was one back in the late 80s called Hipparchus that looked at about 120,000 stars. And what's cool is that you can now combine that data with Gaia's data, compare it, and see if there's been any major changes in about the past two decades That's um, awesome. since that data was taken. So uh, by doing that, they can actually see the motions of stars and other things like that, which is just that's mind blowing to think about uh, that they're capable of doing that. So. There you go. That's what we got. And uh, we are now done with the news. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we are going to talk about Blue Origin and the big news that came out from them, surprisingly, uh, this week. So we'll take that quick break, and we'll see you at the end of it. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our main topic this week, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. You can also find our tomorrow producers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. We are a crowdfunded show, and you can help us out by heading over to patreon.com slash tmro. See the different rewards that you get for different levels, as well as all the different goals that we've got going on, because we're trying to do quite a bit of stuff before we hit orbit 10. All right, uh, on to our main topic.
topic because it's uh, some pretty cool news out of yeah, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think wait, wait, you're more excited than Space Mike. I figured we'd have to get like Space Mike a bag to breathe in or something. Uh. <laughs> this is this is just kind of a little <laughs> out of nowhere enters a blue origin. Oh, by the way, guys, uh, we have a rocket. So that's kind of right? what Blue Origin did. So, right? Blue, hang on, I mean, let's telling the story of Blue Origin a little bit. Jeff Bezos, the CEO and founder of Amazon.com, <laughs> uh, huge space nut, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, he owns Blue Origin as well. He also went to the bottom of the sea and pulled up some of the old F1 engines from Saturn V. Yeah. Right. So I mean, on his own dime, he, he's just doing this because space nerd, hardcore space nerd. Yeah. And he's had Blue Origin for, didn't they start before SpaceX? Ever, yeah. I'm yeah. here positive, I think I'll look older, it up, but yeah. So I believe space, uh, Blue Origin is older than SpaceX, and here you've got SpaceX going up, they've got, you know, they're on their whatever generation of rocket, they've mm -hmm. got, you know, pl Mars plans being announced later this, this month. I mean, a whole bunch of really cool things, but you never heard anything anything out of Blue Origin. Maybe you'd hear, oh, we think they did a test firing of something. September and then, 2000. Yeah, and then yes. September, there you go, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then fairly recently, um, we started hearing more about them with United Launch Alliance. They announced that their BE-4 engine was gonna be uh, the main power plant for Vulcan uh, to the dismay of Aerojet Rocketdyne. And um, you're like, okay, I guess they're working on engines. I guess, yeah. right. and then they're like, oh, by the way, we've got this vehicle, we're gonna fly it, and it's gonna be reusable, and we're gonna land it. And we're like, all right, well, maybe that'll happen someday in the future, and then like two weeks later, like, and here's footage of that. And we're like, oh, okay. Oh, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that came out of nowhere, all right, cool. Uh, and then they did it a couple more times, and we're like, all right, that, that's really awesome. And then, uh, then they started live webcasting it, and, and it just has been kind of growing. And yeah. then recently we got an email, anyone who you can sign up to Blue Origin Updates, and everyone, it was like, what, Thursday morning, Wednesday morning, something like that, got this email from Jeff Bezos, yeah. basically saying, hey, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, and Space Mike, you did a space pod on this. You wanna describe what they're gonna do with their next uh, New Shepard vehicle? Well, with my uh, the space pod that I did uh, uh, for this week, which uh, I put out on Wednesday, which uh, you guys should watch, I, act I actually was focusing more on their next and uh, final flight of their current uh, New Shepard rocket. And uh, I wanted to kind of hold off on this whole New Glenn announcement for uh, the show today. But uh, with this, there was actually an email update last week where uh, Jeff Bezos was describing what they're going to be doing with the fifth flight of New Shepard. And with that, they might destroy the rocket when uh, they try to do an in-flight uh, escape test is what they're calling it, where they're going to be launching, or rather firing, a solid rocket motor that is built into the capsule of the New Shepard uh, system, the, the New Shepard uh, capsule, I suppose. And they're going to be firing that during maximum dynamic pressure. And they suspect that the, the rocket, the New Shepard rocket, will be destroyed when they do that. But if it survives, great. But uh, in any case, they are planning on flying that rocket for the last time until they roll out another New Shepard rocket to continue with their tests we're at and, and eventually to continue with, uh, or rather to begin, their uh, t suborbital tourist market. Um, but with this whole new Glenn announcement, the uh, announcement that came this week, they announced what their next big plan is going to be. And Jeff Bezos has alluded to in the past that they are going to have a orbital rocket. And it wasn't until, I believe, like a month or two ago that we even uh, started uh, hearing what they internally were calling it, or at least their nickname for it, which uh, they were calling Very Big Brother. And from the pictures that we saw um, that Jeff Bezos put out earlier, which, you know, were, were kind of low-def uh, quality pictures, uh, you know, quick an uh, animation there. But it, he described it as being a much larger rocket with a new Shepard rocket as the upper stage. And just from the size of what those old pictures looked like, it looked like it would be, you know, something that would be on the size of like a Delta II rocket or maybe even around the same uh, size and diameter as, as a Falcon 9 rocket, although not as tall. And then he puts out this update this week that actually shows what they're planning on doing with their new Glenn rocket that they previously were calling Very Big Brother. And this is pretty insane. It's uh, 23 feet in diameter, which is about seven, a uh, little over seven meters in diameter. That is a really fat rocket. And it's going to be one of the widest ones. It's going to be uh, wider than the Falcon 9. It's going to be wider than the Delta IV, uh, just the, the main core stage. And it's almost as big as a Saturn V rocket. And this thing was, uh, let me see again, it was um, 313 feet tall, which uh, 
Uh, I can't remember what the conversion for that is off the top of my head. It's about 95 uh, meters. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. A little, little over uh, 95 meters. But in any case, that's a pretty tall rocket and pretty wide, too. And they're going to be using this thing. There we go. Uh, for those of you who couldn't hear, Dutta just informed me that the Saturn V was 333 uh, um, feet tall. So just about uh, 20 feet short of uh, what the Saturn V was. And with this, they're going to be doing the whole reusable uh, landing that they have been previously been doing with the new Shepard rocket and that SpaceX has been doing with their Falcon 9. And it's really exciting. We have uh, animations here that show uh, how they're going to be doing this. And I really like the way that the landing legs are built into uh, the kind of engine skirt, if you will, for this. And I'm really excited about it because uh, it's going to have, uh, it could pot potentially have three stages to it. Uh, the first stage would be powered by uh, their BE4 engines, and the second stage would be powered by a vacuum optimized BE4 engine, which just means that the way that the, the engine bell is shaped and the way that they uh, combust their, their fuels together is optimized for uh, without being inside of the atmosphere. But uh, again, I just really, I'm really excited about this announcement and really excited to see, you know, what other sort of information they're going to reveal to us. I would not be surprised based on, you know, how the information came out with their new Shepard rocket that they've already been doing quite a bit of testing and we might see some, you know, physical hardware very soon. So, ah, it's really exciting. It is exciting stuff. Now, those animations you saw were not official Blue Origin animations. That was actually a Citizen of Tomorrow. It's uh, Atlee Tobiasen, uh, who may, I forgot to put the banner at the bottom of them, so I'm a terrible human being, but uh, created those and uh, said, hey, if you want to use them to the show, you totally can. That's based on the imagery that, so it's purely based on the, the one or two pictures yeah. that Blue Origin has given out. So they could be wrong, but it, it kind of gives you an idea as to what the rocket may look like. I thought that was really, really awesome. So yeah. uh, uh, thank you for making those. Um, it's going to be exciting and huge. I didn't think to grab the, the, the graphic that has, I should have, the graphic that has all the rockets side by side showing how oh, absolutely man. enormous this thing is. It's going to be huge. But going backwards yeah. a step, uh, back to New Shepard. Mm -hmm. uh, New Shepard is going to be awesome because that webcast, Jeff Bezos said they're going to webcast that, and they are expecting mm -hmm. a rapid unscheduled disassembly. Actually, I guess that would be a rapid scheduled disassembly. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Uh, yes. of, yeah. Of their first stage during the abort. So they're going to do one of the things, one of the reasons capsules are awesome when they sit on top of a rocket is if something happens to the rocket, you can safely jettison. Now, I say safely, it is not going to be a fun ride. No. But you can, you can jettison that rocket, or I'm sorry, you can jettison the capsule off of the rocket uh, and, and move to safety. Yes. The hardest part of that is gonna be during max Q, the area of ma maximum dynamic pressure. That's where you're moving just fast enough through just thick enough air where it's putting the most amount of strain on the vehicle itself. Mm -hmm. And so you don't wanna have any weird variations in the aerodynamic yep. structure of the rocket because you're putting all of this force on the rocket. So what they're going to do is they're gonna put a huge amount of additional aerodynamic strain on it by then uh, in issue, uh, issuing the abort command. So they're going to be in max Q, in that maximum aerodynamic envelope, and they're going to say abort. And they're going to take the top of the rocket and jettison it off. And the aerodynamic uh, uncertainty underneath it is likely going to rip apart the first stage. Yes. So now that, that's what's expected. In the email, Jeff Bezos said, however, a few of the Monte Carlo runs, where they run the data over and over and over again in different scenarios, a few of these runs show it's technically possible that we could recover the first stage. It, it, it's a low probability, but it's technically, it could happen. So, one of two amazing, epic, awesome things is going to happen. First, you're gonna he see this giant explosion in the air at <laughs> like, like, like Mach 1 <laughs> with his vehicle just ripping itself to shreds as the capsule moves to safety. That is going to be awesome. Or two, the vehicle is going to be able to survive that and safely land back on their landing pad okay. while the capsule goes to safety, which is also going to be absolutely <laughs> awesome because then they can take it and they can be like, this is, this is a masterpiece of, of awesomeness. We're going to put it in a museum kind this of This is an engineering god. Ka kind of, Basically. right? Basically. So, yeah, so I yeah. actually, uh, I mean, that we should take uh, uh, like virtual bets. I'm in the it's going to rip itself apart 
bet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right? I, I think I'll join you in the rip itself. Apart yeah, I, I don't think it's going to survive. Because this is this is an abort at the worst possible moment. Space Mike? Uh, there is one, one other option as to how uh, it might play out. He said that if somehow it did survive uh, the, the abort itself, and they weren't able to restart the engine to safely land and put it on a, a display, <laughs> that there'll be enough fuel left over inside of the tanks that when it does come crashing down, then it'll have its uh, rapid scheduled disassembly. I that suppose. one would be unscheduled. I think that would be. A, I yeah. think the scheduled disassembly is during the uh, Max Q uh, uh, automatic abort. <laughs> I think an unscheduled disassembly would yeah. be it smashing into the ground at you know that just be below more, mock speed. That might be more an unscheduled. Con Conflagration. So. <laughs> so. Carry on. When do I get to see oh. the scheduled reassembly? <laughs> well, that's, okay, so that's the thing mm. with Blue Origin. We don't, like, they could, for all we know, they have another vehicle in their hangar ready to go, and they'll just, they'll blow up the landing pad and be like, that was cool. Hey, we're going to launch tomorrow again on an upgraded vehicle that, you know, takes all the lessons learned from the first one and uh. makes it even more awesome. <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. I have no. I have no clue what they've got. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's going to be an exciting webcast. They're going to webcast it live, and I think we said this on a previous show. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, I, I guarantee there was a team inside of Blue Origin that fought to allow them to webcast these. And so whoever championed that yes. inside of Blue Origin, because there, there was a you know a small. I'm sure there was a small group of people. There was someone who champ. Whoever championed that. Thank you. Thank for, you. From not just the citizens of tomorrow, but all the space nerds around the world. Thank you for doing that because this is going to be awesome. And we are super, super excited for this particular uh, launch, and, uh, launch and landing, possible landing, or disassembly, whatever that is. Yes. Then yeah. they come out with, as Space Mike mentioned, the new Glenn announcement. Mm -hmm. Now, I felt like a stupid, stupid space nerd when he announced new Glenn. And here's why. I never realized until he announced New Glenn that New Shepard was named after Alan Shepard. <laughs> he said that. He, he, and then I saw New Glenn. I'm like, why would they call it? Oh my God, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I, I legitimately, I should have known better as a space nerd, and I felt so stupid. Uh, apparently, Dutt is saying I'm not alone. You aren't alone. Ben. I didn't think <laughs> so, about that either. I, I, so. I figured it out. I feel less dumb now. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of some yeah. people are like, really yeah, in the, the chat room. Yeah, I mean, the naming convention wasn't readily apparent. No. Uh, Shepherd has a tendency to shepherd new things in. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could have got the very next one could have been New Pioneer. It very, you know, just new colonist. Space Kyle like we, says, we I very, had the exact same reaction. We very I know. easily could have gone, Shepard was not inherently, yeah. So as Space Mike said, New Shepard is one ginormous rocket. It is nearly Saturn V size. This thing. The, the new Glenn. New I'm Glenn. sorry, New Glenn. Yeah, new I'm sorry, I'm sorry. New Glenn, New Glenn. <laughs> new, uh, new Shepard. No, no, New, new, new Shepard, yeah. No, New Glenn <laughs> is a ginormous rocket. It's going to be awesome, and it's going to fly, according to Blue Origin, by the end of the decade. So they've got, what, four uh -huh. years left. Uh -huh. That's not so, a lot of time. I just want to throw Less this out. Than four years. I just want to throw this out there because they also revealed the name of their upcoming rocket yes. after New Glenn as well. Well, wait, hang on. Before we do that, yeah, I, yeah, I want to yeah, I want to yeah, draw yes. a parallel here, okay. right? So, sure. New Shepard is their suborbital vehicle. Yep. Alan Shepard, Shepard suborbital sub flights. Yeah. New Glenn. Oh, thank you, Dada. So here we go. Actually, here here's here's a graphic, right? So there you can kind of see. I uh, I believe I can't really read it from here, but I think uh, is New Shepard on there uh. anywhere? Uh, New Shepard is not on there anywhere. Okay, the, but it would have been on the one left. On the left is Antares. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be like way to the left to give you an idea of the size of what they're flying right now. It'd yeah, be they kind of kept way, all there, so let's yeah. way, so, way to the left, so, like all the way to the left. So if I'm looking at this correctly, from left to right, you've got Antares, Soyuz, Ariane Five, Atlas Five, Delta Four, Falcon Nine, Falcon Heavy, Delta Four Heavy. Vulcan. Vulcan. Okay, yeah. sorry, I can't really see all yeah, that. Yeah, it's, well it's, from the this screens far away. are this far. So Vulcan, so. Fal Falcon Nine. Falcon Heavy, Falcon. Delta IV Heavy, and now we start getting into new Glenn sizes, <laughs> right? And then, and you look to the far right, the, the rocket that took humans to the moon, the Saturn V, that's all the way right. So you look at the three-stage new Glenn, it's nearly as tall as a Saturn V. Yeah. It's, it's ginormous. That is going to be an epic rocket of epic epicness. The first stage is taller than, the, or it's longer uh, than he, the Saturn here's the thing, first stage. Here's the thing with that New Glenn. New oh, Shepard, yeah. suborbital vehicle, Alan Shepard, suborbital flight. New Glenn 
is not a suborbital vehicle. It is an no. orbital vehicle. Yes. Mm -hmm. John Glenn, first, first. or first American to orbit. Uh -huh. They did announce, they teased a third vehicle, a new Armstrong. Oh. If we were to follow that same convention, we can deduce, <laughs> and this is just us speculating, they've never, they've not said anything. We no. can deduce that Jeff Bezos agrees with tomorrow and Dave Mastin mm -hmm. to go to the moon first. He's part, he should be wearing a moon first shirt. Probably. Jeff Bezos, I would like to see you wear a moon first shirt that would confirm my theory. Uh, but Looney you confirmed. <laughs> right? Uh, uh, it sounds like if I were to extrapolate their naming conventions with rockets, <laughs> New Armstrong may be a lunar type of architecture. Uh -huh. I might, know, right? It might be. It, might, it may not be. It, However, yeah, the other way to look at that yeah. is that Neil Armstrong was not only the first American, but the first human on another celestial body. Mm -hmm. That's, That's true. true. You don't have to look at it specifically as the moon. You, per se. You don't. You don't. I, this even is the why this new is... Glenn rocket could send stuff to the moon. It could send a lot of the, uh, the teams competing in the uh, Google Lunar X Prize. It could send a lot of their hardware. I mean, yeah. it's capable enough, or at least uh, according to the specifications that they've put out. Citizen uh, 38, uh, thir or 38916 says, so if Elon becomes the first man on Mars, will Bezos name a new rocket New Musk? <laughs> Maybe. That would be kind of <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> I, it doesn't seem like Jeff Bezos views... Uh, there was an interview, and I, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but you, you were reading about a recent interview, yeah. and it seems like Jeff Bezos is not... Actually, it wasn't an interview. It was when he, he won the Highland Prize, Sure. and he was gonna, he's going to give that money uh, back into the program. So, uh, basically, he, he seems to think that his big com competition isn't SpaceX, it's not uh, United Launch Alliance, it's not Ariane. No, which a lot of people were, I'm sure, confused by until he put out his next sentence. What, did anyone know who his big competition is? Gravity. He gravity. competes with yep. gravity, gravity. Yep. every that's... day. That's his competition. <laughs> is <laughs> gravity, and and I thought that was a great quote. Uh, and you know, he's just he's just working to do these really cool, amazing space things. So I am super duper excited for New Glenn. Yes. And the timeline given, right, three to four years or so, seems potentially viable. I I mean, we don't have really insight into that. It's reasonable. But it's re it's a reasonable time frame. Um, New Armstrong, he didn't get a timeline, he didn't give any data on it outside of that's a future story, mm -hmm. but that's exciting stuff. Yeah. So we've gone from, over the course of this year, 2016, just mm -hmm. this year, uh -huh. mm -hmm. not caring at all about Blue Origin and thinking, yeah, they're just dorking around with engines, to, oh my God, they're doing awesome things. Uh, and I'm super excited. Uh, I, I just, I cannot wait to see what the future brings. We have yeah. got so many awesome announcements coming from Blue Origin, from SpaceX. Uh, Sierra Nevada continues to try and do great things with mm -hmm. um, uh, Dream Chaser. Yeah. I've got Mastin Space Systems coming back on the show. Hopefully he'll be able to talk about some cool stuff well, as and well. And Virgin Galactic is flying again. Virgin mm -hmm. Galactic is flying again. By the way, yep. we've got uh, the CEO of Virgin Galactic coming on the show later this year as well. Our president of Virgin Galactic. Ah, yeah. president of Virgin Galactic coming on the show later this year. So, um... Yeah, awesome no. things. I know. This is such a really exciting time. So uh, uh, on that note, we're going to head into a break and uh, bring up uh, comments from last week's show. What do you think of the New Glenn announcement? What do you think of the new Armstrong? What do you think New Armstrong means? Right? Is that, like Carrie said, could it go somewhere else? Or are they planning on a lunar architecture? Like, are they starting to plan for some sort of return to the moon? What do you think it means? What, are you excited about New Glenn, or do you think these timelines are unrealistic? Leave your comments on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you want. On that note, we're going to take a quick break, and comments from last week's show, up next. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. 
not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Quality base here. The eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We've also got our Tomorrow producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode, as well as our Tomorrow Patreon Plus subscribers. These are people who have contributed $2.50 and cents or more. And from this level and above, all the people that we just saw, you're going to get access to After Dark as soon as it is available, our Google hang Hangouts, and a bunch of other things but wait we've got more we've also got our patrons these are people who've contributed up to two dollars and 49 cents if you'd like to find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow head on over to patreon.com slash tmro all right let's go ahead and get started with some comments although i think there was some stuff that got brought up in the chat yeah johnny spacer uh, in the chat room said uh, they heard charlie bolden isn't very hip with private heavy launch rockets uh, you know, talking about, you know, we were talking about Go Launcher last week. Yep. Uh, so I figured that that was... Oh, uh, we've got a ton coming up this just this year of, yeah. like, new small launcher companies. I do want to yes. point out, uh, in a funny way, though, Lori Garver, mm -hmm. uh, when she heard about Jeff Bezos winning the Highland Prize, uh, a large sword, 250K, giving it to SEDS USA. SEDS USA, yeah. I apologize. I was the like, putting it back in the system. Didn't really answer that question. Students for Exploration and Development of Space. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, Lori Garver tweeted out, by the way, I'm a big fan of commercial investments and big rockets. Jeff Bezos and Elon must seem to be uh, quite normal. Just saying, hashtag I'm a fan, hashtag big rocket. So, uh, go Lori. <laughs> Love She's that She's always one. been a fantastic proponent of commercial yeah. space and helped push when she was a what deputy... Uh, deputy administrator. Deputy administrator. Uh, yeah, she really was the, the pushing force to get commercial space out there. And then we've got uh, the NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden saying, mm, I'm not so sure about, you know, the smaller launchers make sense, but I'm not so sure about the big heavy launchers with, with privatized stuff. That's where, you know, NASA kind of comes in. Right. And you need to understand, like a lot of people are sounded kind of disappointed in that you need to understand where he's coming from. You know, he's the administrator <laughs> of NASA. He's got space launch system like tied to his back, like way in down. It's like, no, no, we want space launch yeah, system. It's... We don't want your rocket. Space launch system is awesome because he's got he's got now two threatening rockets against space launch system, not yeah. just one. Well, th three or four actually. You count Falcon Heavy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's that's up there. Kind of could be potentially threatening a space launch system. Right. Then you've got uh, future announcements from uh, SpaceX. Then you've got uh, the. Um, New Glenn. New Glenn, mm -hmm. both the two and three stage versions. So right. I'll count that as four rockets, kind of threatening space launch system. And the problem with space launch system is it's so freaking expensive, right? It's 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 the Senate launch system, right? It was designed yeah. to keep jobs. It's not it's not designed as a really great engineering article. It's designed to kind of make senators happy. Right. So yeah, and there was also some news this week too that uh, uh, SLS, the Block Two, may not actually come online until the 2030s. I, I so, so Dave Mastin and I have, I, I believe, a steak dinner bet. Dave Mastin doesn't believe SLS will ever. Was it a dollar bet? I'm upgrading. Dennis said to it a was steak. a dollar bet. Uh, yeah, ben so Dennis saying, saying it was dinner. a dollar bet. I'm upgrading it to a steak dinner. Yeah, leave uh, it to Ben to buy a single dollar steak dinner, though. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. If it's I true. may. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think uh, Space Launch System will light its engines and commit to flight at least once. All right. Dave says no. Not not even once. We'll see what happens. Uh, well, we do have a presidential change coming up here, yeah. right? Regardless yeah. of who it is. Yeah. 
right? That's that going to be a change. That could change everything. I, I, no matter who becomes president, you can basically guarantee there will be a change of policy at NASA. Yep. So what happens to Space Launch System? The thing is, they've spent a lot of money on it, and we're bending metal on a it. A so lot of money. It's really hard to cancel at this point. So yeah. I think it will fly <laughs> once. I also think it will only fly once. I think it'll fly twice. Twice? Yeah. Why twice? I think it'll fly the test mission, and mm -hmm. then I think because we, they've already committed Europa Clipper to designing it mm -hmm. specifically for launch on the space launch system, mm -hmm. I think that'll be its second and final mission. I don't think they'll do it. I don't think they'll commit the billion plus dollars to build that second space launch system. I think they'll find a way to drop Europa Clipper on existing infrastructure somehow. I don't know how uh, yeah. or future infrastructure, but we'll see. Uh, space Mike, something else times? about this. Uh, well, no, no, no. Uh, with your prediction. Maybe three times. Three, oh, two, one, two, three, and carry in. Uh, do you predict four times? <laughs> no, I, I predict that while the engines may light, it will not be a commit to flight. Really? Oh. Mm -hmm. You mm, think we'll build it, we'll light fire. the engines, mm -hmm. and we'll never send it to space? Mm -hmm. I think that's the least likely scenario. Doesn't matter. I have to choose something, don't I? And four is really <laughs> unlikely as well. So therefore, <laughs> highest bidder without going over, that's me. Oh, yeah. We are using prices Right rules. I'm sorry. Obviously. Space Mike Andrew, uh, interrupted you. <laughs> you, you, uh, you had another comment. I'm sorry. Uh, something I was going to say regards to Charlie Bolden is I'd be a lot more interested in what his personal opinion on this is. Because as NASA administrator, he has to play the political game more than anyone at NASA. And he has to keep all of these senators and representatives happy when it comes to you know their special project, the Senate launch system. So I feel like he's almost forced to say the comments that he said about not, you know, it's not that he says that I hate, you know, other, you know, heavy lift rockets. It's just that he doesn't think that they're going to be successful. And I feel like he's almost forced to say that, whereas secretly and personally, he's probably rooting them on just as much as, as the rest of us because of what they could potentially take out into space and the missions that we could accomplish with a heavy lift rocket. I don't think a lot of us care which heavy lift rocket helps us to enable our goals to, to bring about the future of tomorrow today. So I don't think he cares either. He That's might, just my opinion, though. He, he might. I mean, we, we would need to ask him. I, I, I'm curious uh, to that point as well, because, you know, there, there is space launch system bogging him down, and he, he does need to help promote that. Uh, however, if you look at the commercial space market over the last year, year and a half or so, there have been a tremendous amount of failures that have occurred uh, with his payload. So, you know, that might put a not so great taste in his mouth for commercial space. I don't know. We need to wait for him to leave office and then loop back around and see if we can get him on the show and be like, hey, yeah. what do you really think? I think that'd be a great interview. Hey, what, was it what were you really thinking <laughs> what, what, for those what eight did you, years? Yeah, exactly. Can we lure him with Uncrustables? <laughs> probably. Probably. We found that that'd be, that's a, a, a likely... Is this a story that I don't know of? Or? Oh, uh, yeah. You know, we'll talk about it in After Dark. Sounds yes. good. All right, cool. Uh, so I've taken Comments a very long last time. last week's show. <laughs> taken a very <laughs> long time, but last week's show was hashtag go launcher. Capcom, give us our first comment. Uh, first comment comes off of tomorrow.tv, and Jim says, would it be possible to get to orbit without ever going supersonic? It's balloon castles, if I recall. I really don't know castles at all. So the thing with orbit <laughs> is it's not... <laughs> uh, the, the thing with orbit is it's not height, it's speed. Yeah. So one way or another, mm -hmm. you have to reach orbital velocity to reach orbit, which yep. means you're go you have to go supersonic. So a little bit beyond supersonic. Uh, well, a little bit, just a, a hair, just a, just a just a pinch. Just a well, pinch. actually, no, because the the speed of sound changes with air density. Yes. So okay, if we're gonna split hairs, does it get louder? Like you that? have none to split, Jared. I know. That's why <laughs> if we're gonna split your hairs, Ben. <laughs> yeah, I have plenty. In any case, we don't have time. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, yeah, you're going to have to go, to, to reach orbital velocity, you're going to have to go uh, 22,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, that's just a thing that you're going to have to 28. do. 28. 28,000. Uh, 20, uh, I know, think I, you said 2,200. 2,200? You're going to have to go a little faster than that. <laughs> <laughs> 28,000 kilometers an hour. Oh, so, 20, you I'm know sorry. What? You just need to go like 70 kilometers an hour. Is there like a ludicrous mode on that for that? <laughs> Did I say 2200? <laughs> you might have. I oh do that all God. the time. I, so I, 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 invert, I invert my twos and eights a lot, so I can see where I got the 22, but I dropped a zero. That's just, that's just bad. 
All right. Um, next up, Capcom. Next up comes from Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Oh, yeah, that's right. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Wait, is it this way? Oh, yeah. Is it this way? Or is it this way? Yeah, it's this way. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. I do have to reverse it for camera. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. Zap Fan, Zap Fan. There we go. We need Zap Fan, Zap Fan. You need to have an engaging comment every week because every week we want to go Zap Fan, Zap Fan. I think we just need that on a t shirt. Oh, yeah. Just like two hands like this. Yes. Underneath this is Zap Fan, Zap Fan. This coming comes off of YouTube. <laughs> oh, no, wait. Okay, so at the top of the shirt, yes. it says Zap Fan, Zap Fan, yes. right? So up here, Zap Fan, Zap Fan, then the two hands like this, and then it says, this comment comes off of YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> or does it say that on the back? Oh, uh, yeah, either way. All right, yep. Okay. All right. It says, good show. Always nice to see some new people getting into the game of small launch vehicles. With this many companies, at least one has to become a success. I hope. Cool DNA sequencer. Last time I used one, they were the size of a fridge. So progress. Soon it will be in an iPhone. We've got more small launchers coming up. This year alone, interviews on tomorrow. Uh, the one I'm most excited about uh, coming up is Vector Space Systems. Yeah. Yes. So they're going to be really cool. Uh, um, we'll have Swiss Space Systems on sometime in the future again as well. Uh, you know, not again, but sometime on in the future as well. Yeah. Uh, so we, the, you're right. There are a ton of small launchers, and that's going to be incredible for the small sat, micro sat, pico sat, nano sat, other small word here, sat. Uh, market because right now it's just too expensive and too complicated to get to space. Yep. And like you said, not all of these companies will survive, but I, I, I agree. I think a handful of them will. And that's going to change that marketplace and how we access space. It's going to be good. It, ultimately, it's all good. All right. Next up, Capcom. Uh, next one comes off of YouTube from Stephen Thompson. It says, if the EM drive turns out to be the real thing, could you build a space castle that just hovers at 101 kilometers? I mean, you'd be in space, but without the microgravity. It could be a great place to do some research with a communications platform, have a restaurant, etc. So... <laughs> Because who I doesn't want to eat inside a balloon castle? I don't know. Let's that, be fair. So I don't think you're going to be able to get a balloon to work even remotely close. No. Oh, an EM drive. You know, you're not going to get enough thrust. Whether... You're not going to get enough thrust off of an EM drive to maintain. Because you'd have to, in order to maintain that without going sideways at uh, 28,000 kilometers, I almost said 100 again, kilometers per hour. I almost yeah. said it's per second, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Fail. No, Ben. Fail. You can't go a you tenth failed, the speed sir. of light and stay in orbit. <laughs> You're saying I, I would break. Or <laughs> no, all right. Uh, um, <laughs> um, what was my point? Oh, I have no the EM idea. drive. The I think drive. the point of this question that I'm a little bit confused about is whether Stephen uh, is wondering if the EM drive would be able to get it up to 101, or if it would be up there uh, <laughs> with the balloon castle and go up Neither with the one of helium those things. I think if you just built something drive. that can hover around 101 kilometers, so that you would be in space but without the microgravity. The problem is, so you can't just say build something to hover to 101. <laughs> That's not a Why thing. Not? You can't because you can't do it. You, you need that velocity. You need the speed. You All need right. orbital velocity to do that. Or if you're going to, if you're going to do that, right? You think of a traditional balloon. None of them can make it to that altitude. That's not a thing. They're not even close. After a certain okay. height. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not. They're not even a third of the way there. Okay. So and you, so you can't use a balloon at that altitude. So you need that speed to compensate for it. The other thing you could theoretically do is if you had enough downward pushing force to compete with gravity constantly mm -hmm. that never stopped. You could, in theory, have that. But I can't think of a single propulsion technology that would be capable of doing that. Nope. That's realistic. Um, nope. That would theoretically be another way of doing it without orbital velocity, but it's an unreal, you just, it's so much easier at that point just to go at orbital velocity and just do that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's gonna require a lot less power, ultimately, to do that than to constantly be like, pressing on the accelerator and fighting Earth's gravity, Earth and Sun's gravity, right. the whole time, right? So. Well, that's all right. Johnny Spacer in the uh, chat room says, just call your space station a space castle. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Sounds they're, good they're to me. They're done. That's I mean, awesome. the Tian Gong is already called Heavenly Palace, so why not? Oh, yeah. yeah. Actually, Tawik had brought up <laughs> an interesting comment earlier talking about... Um, uh, talking about... Um, <laughs> uh, uh, how there's potentially a space bubble right now. Mm -hmm. 
kind of on the last one. So that might be an interesting topic for a future show as well. Is yeah. is the aerospace, the new space market, kind of in a space bubble? So. Uh oh. Well, I mean, it might be, right? We've got all of these new, new small sat launchers. Not all of them are going to survive. Yeah. I don't think he's entirely wrong. There is going to be a bit of a pop there where a bunch of them disappear because right now, today, cool. at yeah. least, there's not enough market for all of these things. All of these companies are assuming that the market will kind of become when they are able to fly. And if it doesn't generate, if it doesn't what am I trying to say? Form. If it doesn't jumpstart or have new product or something like that, then it could fail. Then there's and not, something there that really many, worries me. Yeah, there are too many yeah, launchers are, for the market right now. But the thought is that's okay because right now you just simply can't fly anything at a reasonable price, so there is no market. So the thought process is if we make it low cost enough, then the market will come because now people will be able to fly things, which will generate more revenue. So we'll see. They could be right. That's kind of a Silicon Valley approach <laughs> to it. They could be right. The market could form or it could never appear, at which point Tewicket is right and they just go and pop. Yeah. So, I mean, not and all. And even of them the existing away. market, even with the existing market, something that really worries me is it seems to me like one out of every six uh, communication satellites are providing satellite TV service. And looking at you know uh, economist numbers, it looks like the satellite TV industry is very very close to dying. And you know even even cable TV is, is getting pretty close to dying too. So I mean that represents a pretty large chunk of the communication satellite market, which is what most you know commercial uh, payloads are. are communication satellites or imaging satellites. So if those companies, if those industries die, then you know there goes a whole bunch of existing customers now if no new customers materialize. I'm gonna, so, yeah, so I'm going to push back on that a little bit in that, yeah, so I think cable is dying and DirecTV or the, the, the satellite markets are dying simply because Internet, uh, internet is taking over that, right? People are, I, I don't own cable or satellite, right? I watch all my TV off the internet and more and more people are going to do that, mm -hmm. which means you're gonna need more and more internet. And so cable is just gonna move over to just an internet only service provider. Well, so then can't you look at it like all these small sat providers? It feels as though there's, you know, 1500 of them out there in the market now, but there's really only a need for you know, 500 of them, mm -hmm. can some of them possibly consolidate and then be able to say, oh, not only can we launch from America, we can also ma ma launch from Australia, we can launch from Spain, we can launch from all these other places, yeah. you know, so that, but now they're the same company as opposed to all of these different companies. Yeah, we, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, oh yeah. yeah, I think that will happen regardless. So let's just say that the if the market collapses onto itself, mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the companies will actually just kind of go away, and you'll just see these other companies kind of build up. However, if it goes the other way, um, and I, I kind of lean towards it will go the other way because finishing my other point, um, yeah, we're moving away from these things, move to the internet, but that means we're going to need a lot more internet capable things. And you can still do the internet from space. And in fact, the number of satellites you need for internet from space is way more than what you need for like a direct TV type service. Yeah. Because you need them to be low horizon. So you need a lot more to cover the space. You need a lot more bandwidth, a lot more launches. So that market could actually get a lot larger, not necessarily a lot smaller as we transition from traditional television watching to internet based systems for a unified thing. Okay. So having said that, if that happens and you need, you know, all of these different companies, I think we will see a bunch of them start to merge together and become larger and larger and larger entities yep. uh, before, and you'll end up with, instead of, you know, 10 or 20 different small sat launchers or companies, you'll end up with like two or three when it's all said and done in mm -hmm. the next 20 to 50 years. Whew. All right. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I agree. Next up. <laughs> uh, next one comes off of YouTube. This was from Kurt Stolpa. Solids or chemicals, pshaw, beep, beep. go nuclear. Beep, 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 beep. Just look at the success of the Pan Am Clipper in 2001. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, actually, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Look at Voyager. Still humming along. Yep. Uh, you know, Still curiosity. operating. Yeah. Not Obviously not with all of its instruments on all Wait. at once, but, you know. Oh, oh, I didn't... <laughs> I didn't realize that uh, that I had done this. I didn't pay attention to the show notes. So uh, I don't know who this last person is, but they're devilishly handsome. So go ahead and uh, 
Yeah. Long time watcher, first time commenter, Dutta says. All right, go ahead. Go ahead, Capcom. Yeah, this last one comes off of Twitter from someone named Ben Credible. Yeah. Sounds like an idiot. Uh, Adam look, look how Look how gorgeous he is, though. I can't see. It's too far uh, away. That girl next to him is really hot, though. <laughs> Uh, I, would, I would love to do a live Skype interview with you on an upcoming episode of At Tomorrow. Willing to pay in gourmet hamburgers. So, <laughs> oh, and Dutta's going to uh, go directed type. directed at Burt Rutan. Yeah. <laughs> Dear Burt Rutan, we looked at your Twitter account. It's amazing. You love hamburgers. We will give you gourmet hamburgers if you come on our show and talk about the cool vehicles that you're building. You helped... I mean, you ultimately created Spaceship One, Spaceship Two, and you took a 747 and had him slice it in half because it's awesome. So please come on the show and talk about the future of space. Again, we know you love gourmet hamburgers because of your Twitter account. And for all of you people watching this show and would like to see Burt Rutan's Twitter account, I believe it's just twitter.com slash Burt Rutan. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's all sorts of awesome. But don't expect any spacey type of stuff. It's, no, no. Yeah, yeah, there you go, at Burt Rutan. Mm -hmm. Don't expect any sort of sp spacey type of stuff. No. It will be filled with nothing but foodie talk. It's great. All he talks about is hamburgers and eating them. <laughs> He's literally like, it's literally like, long day of testing, that means I want a hamburger, you know? Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, Burt. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. amazing. Yep. We will give, as Colton says, we will give you all of the hamburgers. We tweeted him, so that was a real tweet that we sent out once we yeah. figured that out. Uh, however, uh, Bert has not said anything since 2015, so it is completely yeah. possible that he is, his if Twitter he, account is dead. If he ever comes on the show, we should totally get like hamburgers delivered here. Oh my and, god! And I, have an after dark, but like like a like a hamburgers off. after dark. Yeah, I, I like agree. A, I think I think what, but yeah. we need to have because I, I assume that he's not going to come like in studio. Although that would be awesome if you yeah. want to come in studio. We're we're in Orange County. We'll bring you to we'll bring you to Disneyland. And you can look at the Moonliner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I've done that. <laughs> where do you think I get my... I, I build cooler vehicles than that. Where do you think I got my idea for circular windows from? So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but seriously, Bert Rutan, if you come in studio at Disneyland on us, uh, however, if it's a Skype interview, we'd have to send him a series of different gourmet hamburgers, and then we would have to have our own gourmet hamburgers here, and then in After Dark... We, we would have them like on the desk, maybe like could... during the interview, and then after dark we would sample each one and give a review <laughs> of each gourmet hamburger. I think that is yes. the thing that would need to Reviewing happen. Reviewing burgers with Burt Rutan. Re oh, yeah! That is, a, that is the next show of tomorrow. Hold on. Is Bur Reviewing Burgers with Burt Rutan. You're like, burgers with Burt. <laughs> Burt's Burgers. Burt's, Burt's Burgers. burgers. <laughs> <laughs> we should make a shirt of that. We're going into After Dark. Thank you everyone so much for watching. Uh, next week we have got... Um, uh, Mark with the Martian Garden, check this out. Uh, you're familiar with the lunar regolith. Uh, this is simulated Martian regolith. Wow. Yep. All right, here you go. So simulated Martian regolith. It's not candy? It's not. Don't eat it. No, please don't. Uh, however, you can, in fact, you get a little kit. This is the Martian Garden. You get this cool little kit, and you can plant your own Martian food in Martian regolith. So if you want to become Mark Watney, you can totally do that. The best botanist on Mars. The best and botanist. Potatoes on are super easy to grow. Trust me, super easy. What about corn? <laughs> Corn's pretty easy too, actually. This Excellent. is coming up next week. Uh, our own Lisa Stojanovsky is going to be at IAC giving a presentation about actually growing plants on Mars. So next week is the Plants on Mars episode, uh, and this is going to be pretty cool. <laughs> I'm very excited for that. And Jared, you will be taking that particular interview solo. Yeah, it's I'm, be a lot I'm of really fun. looking forward. So that uh, that says so that Ben doesn't kill it. You'll remember we had succulents on the set for one week <laughs> before us. we killed them. As the son of a florist, I am very excited about this. This is really cool. So. Martian regolith, build your own Mars plants. That's coming up next week. Uh, stay tuned. After Dark is up next. See you next week. See ya.